the furry dog with the red collar <laughs> easily caught the big. <laughs> so, uh, if you remember sentence diagramming from English class, this type of tree or this diagram tree is already a kind of interesting sentence structure because it placed the noun and the verb and the subject together in a structure with its modifiers. It's already a, an interesting way of visually conveying these relationships. And so when we start to think about spaces, like in public spaces, private spaces, we start to see that diagram there of a typical house. It, it takes on some of the similar structure of relationships and connections and even graphic hierarchy. When we talk about graphic hierarchy, what's the first thing your eye goes to in that bubble diagram there? So the living room takes a certain precedent of, or prescience over uh, the other subspaces, and we can start to see key relationships between these spaces and this, the private spaces of the house that, that perhaps in terms of how this house is oriented to the street or oriented to uh, uh, its arrival point, <clears throat> there's, there's a graphic hierarchy that, that leans towards the living room itself. When we get into more complex systems, Paul would use diagramming methods to start to convey the, the sometimes difficult ways that people would circulate through spaces. This is a medical care facility, hospital of some kind, and he would use diagramming to help map out the possible conflicts, which in a hospital, there's a lot of conflict <laughs> um, in terms of circulation and patients can't mix with this and orderlies can't mix with this. There's a lot of different really complex operations that go into how people circulate through something like a hospital or an airport where some people cannot mix with others pre-checkpoint, post-security checkpoint. Diagramming starts to help convey these complex relationships against each other. Um, this is Paul's own house. <laughs> it's about four blocks that way. He lives in the neighborhood. Um, and uh, it's interesting how he starts with very simple bubble diagrams to, to illustrate the relationships of spaces, and then starts to bring in orientation to the street, orientation to cardinal directions, orientation to the sun, and starts to break up a public and private zone to the house itself. And it's those relationships that helped him later on get a little bit, a little bit more grid oriented. You can see how the house is laid out on a grid, maybe a structural grid, maybe a spatial grid. Using this type of diagramming technique, which is a, still a bubble, but it's, uh, it's something a little bit more, like, kind of like a boxy bubble. <laughs> and within with shade and tone and hatch, and uh, arrows and things of that nature starts to illustrate the, the relationships of the house as one circulates through it. Later on, as, you, as he flips back into architectural drawing methods, you can still see the relationships between this hand-drawn floor plan and the sort of the bubble diagram, how things start to flow together. That is his house. It, I've been there. It's, <laughs> it has this, this particular layout on the first floor in orientation to the street in orientation to a backyard. So it's this type of graphic language that we'll start to use uh, next week and practice next week to, uh, for, for a good diagramming method that will help you convey some complex relationships to others. Graphic emphasis, we use different line types, different line weights, and again, different line types, dots, dashes, and the like, both for our hand methods and for computer. So we'll, we'll go into the stroke menu into uh, Adobe Illustrator and start to continue to uh, convey some different graphic types. We often use, in black and white drawings, we often use different tones or hatches to illustrate those relationships. So just with that variation of line weight, line type, and tone, we can start to show emphasis and start to map out things uh, geographically. That goes for both hand and for, and for illustrated methods. This, by the way, is the quad right here. This is cap <laughs> looking south. So a lot of the diagrams he did for his books were actually here. <laughs> so you can start to pick apart that, oh yeah, that's cap. <laughs> there's Neely, there's business building. And then other site orientation diagrams, when we're starting to communicate 
specific aspects of a site, whether it be tree cover or relationship to a, a road or to a river or to the sun. We'll use diagramming methods and what we typically call site analysis diagram to help map out key views, winter wind, summer wind, the, the arc or axis of the sun. So we can help communicate to the client the optimal placing of a building or placing or clusters of buildings or, or how the site might operate with relative to the sun. Um, a lot of folks don't know that if you turn a building 45 degrees to, to the east-west and you corner it so that it's uh, 45 degrees from, from parallel, that you get light in every, in most of your spaces twice a day from, from east to west. Something Frank Lloyd Wright used to do. He would just, he would lay out the T-square, grab a 45 degree triangle and orient the building so that the corner was facing south as opposed to one of the sides. And that way light would enter the, enter the house or the building twice a day. So just sighting a building relative to the sun can make a huge difference in the quality of that entire development spaces later on. So that so site analysis is, is important to convey to the client because the decisions that you're making about the development <clears throat> might have implications for uh, orientations to views, the sun, or, or, or even good wind. Uh, this book is out of print. Actually, it's still on demand printing. <laughs> the new publishing environment we're living in is that some authors can't get large distribution, but they can still publish their books on demand. <laughs> And uh, Ed White wrote this book, I think, in the late 70s, early 80s, and it's still influential to us because it's, uh, it's these diagrams that help illustrate how a development might perform in sun or wind or sit on a site. And some of his graphic symbols and arrows and shapes and tones are things we still use today. There are quick, quick ways to convey specific information in a notebook that help illustrate to the client, you have this, if you do this, this will happen. You have trees on this side, they will help block the wind. Let's put the development around those, not tear them all down, et cetera. So it's diagrams that help accompany our analytical judgment. The urban planner's greatest tool is your analytical judgment, your greatest asset greatest um, gift to the public is your analytical judgment. To convey your analytical judgment, you often use diagrams if they're visual part of communicate that analytical judgment beyond words. Okay. And then more examples of those looser diagrams. We can no, many of these are done ink line on pen on paper but we have adapted, adopted a lot of these same graphic types for Adobe Illustrator as we build up diagrams uh, on top of geographic information or on, or on site information. So very influential book. Let's see all these different line types over here. Very influential book for architects, landscape architects, and planners for three or four generations <laughs> of folks. And then the diagrams get more specific to site location or site orientation. So a lot of information that we can communicate to the client regarding some of the best decisions that do have to be made in terms of how we site buildings or how we develop the site in further, further considerations. Other books, Landscape Graphics is one that we pull from. Uh, this is one of the gold standards for our friends in landscape architecture. Some of the diagramming methods are quite similar. So variations of graphic weight or, or graphic line hierarchy, as well as line type. Arrows that start to convey topography or emphasis or meandering. So we'll practice some of those things next week. Starting to build up symbols, shapes and symbols, using the markers and using the different felt tip pens. We'll practice some of that next week all the way into uh, conceptual layouts for sites <clears throat> that might incorporate uh, circulation or even edges. How we move through space, how we move through a district, how we move through a city, how we start to 
lay out a site. <coughs> um, other folks, one of my favorite firms from London, Rogers Stirk Harbor, Harbor and Partners. This is um, on the edge of Hyde Park. One of the more expensive developments they ever did, but I think just in the culture of the firm, even though you're talking about a billion dollar development <laughs> of high end housing on the edge of Hyde Park, not far from Buckingham, um, this firm still uses diagrams to convey some of the some of the decisions that they had to make regarding solar orientation and views into the park. Um, and then other examples of how all these other symbols, the smiley sun might be <laughs> a little bit too comical for some folks, but uh, maybe some clients like it <laughs> and uh, communicates to them. And then I teach a short graphics elective in the spring that starts to just focus on those hand methods and starts to look at diagramming and uh, representation of people and places and, and trees and things of that nature just with uh, hand methods. So this is one exercise from that particular elective, but it, it has a way of illustrating a concept for a highway exit that might, might model a lot of the decisions that we'll be making as planners in the future. Other graphic artists, uh, Rem Kohlhaas is known as a Dutch architect primarily. They do deal with some urban design planning projects. Working with graphic designer Bruce Mao, uh, back before, <laughs> well, back before COVID <laughs> and before, uh, before I think the internet really took over media I, I, in hypermedia, they would illustrate a book once a year or every two years that really started to illustrate and map some really complex issues in society. And uh, so some fascinating diagrams from that series of books from Rem Kohlhaas and Bruce Mao. Sometimes it's not just what the map is saying, but how the map is used, or how it's paired. And you start to look at the relationships between, I mean, just the, 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 the power of how these maps are used starts to illustrate some and, uh, so what is the relationship between suicide and depression? <laughs> or what is the relationship between number of prisoners and illiteracy? What is the relationship between uh, quality, I believe that's quality of life, or quality of control, international standards organization guideline products, okay, and GDP. So that in itself is a pretty powerful message of how you group different layers of information together. And I think this <laughs> military expenditure per capita, that's, that's something we all have to rethink <laughs> uh, perhaps in the next election or the next election cycle. We started mapping out trade, commercial exchange and trade. Again, pre-COVID, post-COVID, pre-Brexit, post-Brexit. The Brexit debate I think is more interesting and more easy to understand if you understand that European Union is its own number one trade and once you understand that, oh, and Brexit starts to take on a different animal in terms of where is Britain going to get their food <laughs> in the next year? <laughs> These are real issues. Uh, once you understand that the European Union doesn't typically trade outside of itself. So um, those are some key issues as folks filling their prescriptions and finding green peppers in Britain <laughs> are going to be finding in the next year. I think it's Domino's Britain has stockpiled frozen vegetables enough <laughs> to fill pizza orders post Brexit. But we use diagramming methods to do that. We might use sizes or shapes, shape size to, to illustrate density. We might again use line type or line weight to illustrate a stronger relationship versus a weaker relationship. The, the graphic language is the same as what Paul gave us 30 years ago in his book, uh, but he, the graphic tools are different because we can do all this in Illustrator now. And then what we typically call a heat map, classification of a heat map, one more intense color versus a less intense color illustrates hierarchy and relationships as well relative to these, these geographic notions. So number of cellular phones, number of computers, researchers in R&D, and then students. And you can see the geopolitical situation is, is 
changing, rapidly changing, uh, based on all of this information. Another magazine that be before anybody remembers magazines. <laughs> Any of y'all remember magazines? They were web pages on paper. They were great. They were like web pages on paper. All right. Good Magazine was one of my favorites. It used to be able to get this at Starbucks, <laughs> every Starbucks. It's still around online, of course. It's not printed anymore. But their, their graphics department was incredible. Uh, I think rivaled the graphics department at USA Today just for some, how the inventiveness of how they would group information. Um, mapping distribution of income by religious belief. And so um, looking at different uh, religious groups and then income from less than $20,000 all the way to $100,000. And we can see, we can see graphic intensities in a couple of the different groups here versus others. So the, the graph is using an ordering system, a radial system. It's using pictorial representation of worship facilities, which there are some architectural implications and conventions that are associated with those religions. And then using color intensity for, from light to shade to convey greater wealth or less wealth. So using color, using an ordering system, using pictorials, and then using that graphic hierarchy to convey that system. This one hit me. You know how some graphs or infographics do you think about it? Think about it. The amount of water that it takes to produce heat is astounding compared to even other animal types. And a graph like this can really start to convey how much, how many gallons of water it takes to produce heat. And then we think about we think about our meat consumption relative to the amount of fresh water we have, the amount of fresh water we're going to have, given our climate change situation. This will become a political issue, or it is becoming a political issue in America. Um, this, this party wants to take away your cheeseburgers. <laughs> okay. But it's not that they don't like cheeseburgers. Lots of people like cheeseburgers. It's the implications of it on the planet and on farming and on water and what it takes to produce that heat. And what is happening in rainforest climates surrounding the demand for it. So a graph like this can, can be very powerful because it can, for me, it, it started to change my way of thinking and change the way I started to eat. Other things, this is a fascinating one, who is coming to America using different color and different hierarchies, but it's patterned off of the U.S. flag. This would be a very different diagram if it didn't have the image of the flag as its base it would be a very different image. So very powerful. Again, a powerful image based on an abstraction of the US flag. That really jumps off the page. And using shadow and color intensity and color contrast, this 80% gray. Again, this would be a very different diagram if it were, if we're on a white background. <clears throat> uh, but there's something about that 80% gray <clears throat> and the 60% gray that makes the colors really pop. Pop. <laughs> um, how to curl. <laughs> Every four years, uh, Americans invade Twitter with the question of what the hell is curling? <laughs> because the Winter Olympics <laughs> uh, has it, and because the curling games are so long that typically there is curling on almost 24 hours a day during the Winter Olympics. <laughs> so, <laughs> simple diagram that starts to illustrate. Um, uh, the game, the origins of the game, and the, and the terminology of the game. But yeah, every four, four years, there's lots of questions on Twitter as to what the hell am I looking at? <laughs> uh, Kevin Lynch is an author, urban planner, um, and urban designer that wrote a book called Image of the City in 1961. He um, argued that city imageability, that was the word he used, imageability, the way to read a city versus another city. To be able to read one city versus another could be illustrated just by through these particular elements. 
Paths, Edges, District Nodes, Landmarks. That if you started to map that out, you could read one city versus another. He used a simple diagramming method in the 1960s. Interesting that he used the Star of David for <laughs> landmark versus the triangle, but he used um, in, uh, these additional tones and lines to do that and started to create a mapping language um, that he could use to read one city from another. He and his students would use interviews as their primary conveyance. So this is more of an anthropological method of interviewing and uh, uh, people's feedback. So that's LA, downtown LA, I should say. <laughs> um, smaller downtown than others, but, uh, but a notice noticeable one. Th these are some of the diagrams that he and his students started to make as they were mapping those particular elements uh, against the, the geographic complexity of the city itself. So by just drawing away or pulling away layers of information, you're starting to be able to read them against everything else. There are some civic spaces in LA, Grand Park, City Hall, um, that are noticeable landmarks. That's the Chandler Pavilion, Disney Concert Halls, just to the, just next to it. And it's, it's on axis with other government centers. So mapping that, it starts to map, Grand Park starts to become an element in the diagram. Here's City Hall here, uh, lined up with Civic Center and the courthouse. So he and his students were starting to make these maps not based on, well, based on geographic information, but, but where people would identify as a landmark or as where they would hang out or they wouldn't hang out. And then started in the 60s, started mapping out the different ethnic, ethnocentric areas of LA as they started to identify around food and around culture and even around religious services and things like that. It's this type of method that had a great influence on us as planners, as we started to diagram cities and districts and neighborhoods against each other. Again, we don't use the same symbols anymore, but the method of graphic intensity, shade or, shade or tone or color or line type or line weight is something we still use when we make our diagrams. So very influential to us. Now, Google is starting to do some interesting things with their mapping. They're starting to convey the gray as the typical urban city grid. They're starting to use this tan color in every mapping uh, uh, application for every city to indicate this is a collection of interesting places, interesting things. Um, and so already, just with that color difference, it's starting to convey that the likely concentration of retail, concentration of restaurants, concentration of culture, they're noticing that through, through their mapping interface, there's, there might be something interesting happening. How do they do that? They do it through the intensity of check-ins to the places directory, and Android users, <laughs> they also track speed and location of Android devices, concentration of Android devices. That's how Google is able to their traffic intensity, because they're actually tracking all of the Android traffic. So that is how they start to, to put those things together. I always <laughs> thought that they <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it makes you think, you're like, wait a minute, what traffic is that? Why? Um, the places directory, which is every check-in, every address business, is mapped onto their interface. And that, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, is what Pokemon uses. They use the Google Places directory to create their maps, their, their gyms, their, what do they call place marks or landmarks? Yeah, yeah. So they actually use, use that directory to start to create the game. And uh, so that's why, as I, was, I said on our walk two weeks ago, that's why there were, there were 300 people in downtown Muncie because there was a concentration of historic buildings, restaurants, and landmarks. National Register buildings, that's what created all the intensity around that game. And so those are mapped. We, if we look at the different layers, uh, Professor Yu is going to be installing Google uh, Earth Pro on the computers tomorrow for us. So thank her. Again, thank, thank Professor Yu. Um, so we'll be able to start to map and look at those 
buildings um, against these different marks. Um, the Google Earth Pro has some wonderful 3D imagery that we can fly over different cities, not all cities, <laughs> but larger cities, including Muncie and Indianapolis. So we'll be able to look at cities uh, in a new way shortly with Google Earth. Uh, another district that they mapped was uh, called Beacon Hill, a very wealthy neighborhood right next to Boston Common and uh, the Government Center. One of the more visited parts of Boston, great collection of row houses and, uh, and businesses, and great, some great historic fabric as well. So he and his students would start to look at the figure ground, building versus non-building, or mass versus void. That's a diagramming method we often use. But also they got into how do how do never what do residents call the sub-districts in the neighborhood? What is the anthropological or cultural name for one sub-district for another? And then they started mapping things that other folks wouldn't map. <laughs> Institutional uses versus antique shop. <laughs> Look at all the antique shops on Charles Street. And that's where you'll notice in the Midwest we often adopt, adapt or adopt. Uh, street names from other cities. Uh, my hometown in Michigan has a Broadway, for instance. It's not like Broadway in New York, <laughs> but it's still called Broadway uh, because of the influence of a lot of the cities on the eastern seaboard. This is an interesting map. It's topography plus steep streets. <laughs> interesting grouping, but sorry, steep streets. Yeah. They mapped that relationship uh, because it, it was an interesting grouping because you look at the neighborhood like that, you would assume it's all flat <laughs> and it's not flat. It's, it's, it's called Beacon Hill because it's a hill. And uh, once you start to map those two things against each other, you realize as you're walking up these streets, so you're like, oh, <laughs> um, that there might be a relationship between those steep streets and the topography itself because the map, other maps make it look flat and it's, it's not flat. Yeah. Oh yes, yes. In 61, 62, when they were doing this, they are, they had, some satellite photography. Some. I mean, CIA had it, because we, <laughs> we were <laughs> YouTube spy planes and stuff like that. There was the beginning of, of early, uh, not satellite, but aerial photography of cities and maps. Or they would take an existing map that the cartographer had made of the neighborhood and then overlay it. So the, they were already starting to trace information off of existing cartographer. Artographic maps of the neighborhoods. But it was a time of early aerial photography. We know that from the Cuban Missile Crisis and things like that, that the higher resolution films were starting to happen. <laughs> and then you may know the story of Gary Powers, who was a U 2 spy plane uh, pilot that was shot down over the Soviet Union, and then getting him back. And that, that was a whole, a whole thing. <laughs> but Kevin Lynch and his students were mapping, I think the big point here is that they were mapping things that most folks probably weren't interested in, but they wanted, they were curious about inset doorways and brick sidewalks. So they started mapping that. And they saw that that starts to give the character of the neighborhood or what's the other one? Bay windows and ornamental ironwork. So that concentration starts to tell you something about that neighborhood that's interesting about it. At least to us, right? Urban planners, urban designers, historic preservationists, architects, landscape architects. So we use the same methods. <laughs> this is pre Luke. Uh, that white pillow thing is the RCA dome. Most Hoosiers know it as the Hoosier dome and, and still call it the Hoosier dome. They should. <laughs> uh, John Mellencamp did a sold out show there, <laughs> YouTube played there. And that was the original home of the 1984 post Baltimore Colts. Those of us who were born in Maryland do not forget that they were the Baltimore Colts. <laughs> but 
that's a long story. Um, we did a charrette in 2000 as uh, the, the uh, Central City Regional Center plan started to come together about this entire south side. Uh, the remarkable devastation, tear down, disinvestment in the neighborhood south of Union Station. So we were very interested in that future. So we started to map it and it's, we used those elements, paths, edges, districts, landmarks, and nodes, isolating that those groups of elements from the map to help them help us understand them better. And so we used a graphic method to do that. The impact of the highway. <laughs> wow. I mean, if you look at an aerial of this part of Indianapolis in 1940, it is a dense, thriving urban neighborhood. Um, and it's not that it wasn't that <laughs> in 2000. It's still recovering today. But it's because of the highway, the impact of the highway. Uh, we back up here. Back up, Lauren. <laughs> uh, the figure ground is quite impactful because uh, it helped us understand that bigger building footprints were indicative of the industrial area inside of the home. And these were all factories. I'm a chain factory, this is a historic factory. Much of this has been wiped out because Luke is now taking off all of this. And then the historic neighborhoods, the great Shakura is gone. Cutting the Palmer <laughs> is on this side. This was this was a Jewish neighborhood in the middle, middle school. So there's still remnants of those buildings, uh, those synagogues, house of worship. The Lily campus coming in, the Lily building here, and then dominating this whole area for about 30 years. And then erecting fences that protest. Protesters, so that enclosed campus feel, and then the remnants of Fletcher Place and Fountain Square that were completely bisected by the highway. So the urban fabric of Virginia Avenue, as it comes from, from downtown, radiates down toward Fountain Square. My favorite, my favorite downtown um, The highway completely bifurcating that urban fabric and changing it. Still recovering 50 years later. Yes, so the highway has an impact, still has an impact, particularly if you have something like asthma. <laughs> it has an impact today. So, those were some of the things we started to study. Um, and what the diagramming method was help, helped us frame our minds in terms of what the issues were about the future of the neighborhood was really how to deal or impact around the impact of that highway. We can do it in PowerPoint. <laughs> you can do much of this in PowerPoint, just with the tools in PowerPoint. It's amazing. Um, so if you find yourself in a professional situation where you don't have the Adobe Suite, um, there's still quite a lot you can do uh, with PowerPoint um, by hand. Uh, well, you know, these are the same methods. So this is me using those graphic methods to start to convey some information using the same symbols, the same tones.